The Abbott government is on a collision course with the ACT over same-sex marriage laws, the new laws in the Capital Territory uh, to be challenged in the High Court. What's actually at issue here and where might this issue end up? To help us understand, the Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus is in the Breaking Politics studio. Welcome back to the studio, um, Mr Dreyfus. Good nice to be to here. Have you in. Um, first, just to, to set the scene for this debate, what is your personal position on whether same-sex marriages uh, ought to be fully recognised in this country or not? I support marriage equality. I've made that clear for a long time now, and it's ALP policy that there should be marriage equality, but with a conscience vote in the national parliament. So tell us, how much is this fight in the High Court about marriage equality? I think this fight in the High Court that's been started uh, by the Commonwealth Government in a highly unusual step uh, is a diversion from the real issue, the real political issue, which is national marriage equality. And the reason I say it's a diversion is that all that the High Court will be deciding is a narrow technical question about the extent of self-government powers in the Australian Capital Territory. So if that's the case, am I right to assume that had Labor won the September election, there would be no challenge? to the laws that the ACT has enacted? Well, I think that's an entirely hypothetical question. We're not the government. Uh, it's a matter for the government. Uh, I think that this government should be allowing debate in the proper place, uh, which is the national parliament. It's a national question. It's a political question. It's not some technical legal question. And the proper place for that kind of debate is the national parliament. You're critical, though, of the issue being taken to the High Court, a, a, di a diversion as you say, presumably that says were Mark Dreyfus Attorney General, he wouldn't be doing the same thing. I, mean, I, I very much doubt it, um, but it's a diversion and you, 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 need to, you, you should watch in coming months and see how Mr Abbott and Senator Brandis use this as a, as a diversion. They'll be saying to deflect uh, demands that there be a bill introduced in the Commonwealth Parliament or demands for national debate, they'll say that matters now in the High Court. And your viewers should bear in mind that what's before the High Court will be a narrow technical question about the powers of self-government in the ACT. You are also, you are a supporter of same-sex marriage. You are also, aren't you, if you frustrate the Commonwealth's efforts or you oppose the Commonwealth's efforts in the High Court, you're a supporter, at least for now, of inconsistency in our national marriage laws. That is allowing the ACT to have a position that isn't the national position. Well, I don't accept that there is inconsistency. What you will have is uh, a position that the Territory will have legislated on a subject that the Commonwealth has not legislated for, which is same-sex marriage. The Commonwealth has legislated for marriages between a man and a woman, and quite explicitly so. But that's the argument that's going to be had in the High Court. Uh, I think it's long past time that we should be continuing this debate in the National Parliament. I'd say again, it's a diversion to go to the High Court. It's very unusual for the Commonwealth Government to seek to litigate with its own territory. The Commonwealth can introduce legislation to deal with anything that the ACT chooses to do. Uh, what you've got here is a government running away from this issue. OK, as a, as a person who has considerable knowledge in this area, how is the High Court likely to find in this case? I'm not going to give you a prediction of how the High Court's likely to rule. The matter's before the, before the High Court. What I would say is Senator Brandis should release the advice. He's already described what the conclusion he has in, is in the advice that he's got from the Acting Solicitor General. He should release it so that uh, the rest of Australia can see what reasons are being offered and what's the basis for him going to court. Um, I think that... What you're seeing repeatedly from this government is a government that's hiding away. It's a, the self-described government in waiting has become a government in hiding. Uh, and this is more of the same. They're seeking to shove this problem off to the High Court, uh, pretend that they're dealing with it, uh, when in fact what they should be doing is bringing it into the National Parliament or, or at least allowing debate in the National Parliament. So if they were to bring a bill into National Parliament, National Parliament that sought to protect the consistency of the Marriage Act nationally, and that was their argument, in other words, overturn the ACT laws, how would you and Labor vote? We'd have to look at the terms of the bill. It would depend on uh, whether it would be properly characterised as just an attack on the freedom of residents of the ACT to govern themselves, uh, or whether it's got some wider consequence. But as I've said, we've got very clear Labor Party policy to support 
marriage equality, but with a conscience vote on that question uh, if the matter comes before the Australian Parliament. Do you see this as a moral issue or a human rights issue? Uh, and by that I mean if it's a human rights issue, uh, presumably a conscience vote is no longer so appropriate, is it? If it's talking about the need for um, equality for uh, same-sex couples, saying that they are discriminated against. I think it can be seen as both a moral issue and a human rights issue, but for the moment, Australian Labor Party policy, very clear policy, is that there's to be a conscience vote for members of our parliamentary party. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there should be a change to that. That's the position as it stands. And we've had one conscience vote uh, some months back. And, uh, of course, at that time, the Liberal Party, under Mr Abbott, was not prepared to allow a conscience vote by their members. And I'd call on Mr Abbott again uh, to allow... It won't be him bringing a bill for marriage equality. I don't expect that but he should be allowing his members to vote in accordance with their consciences. Well, Prime Minister Abbott has said often enough that this issue may come up in the joint party room, the coalition, uh, the, the National and Liberal Party room, for a vote. What do you think is the real motive here? Do you think we will simply never see reform in this regard from this government? Uh, I'm hoping that there will be reform. I'm hoping that Mr Abbott will follow the lead of the Conservative governments in the United Kingdom and New Zealand, both governed by Conservative governments where marriage equality has become a reality in recent times. We've now got a Conservative government in Australia. Uh, he should follow the lead of, uh, of those governments. What does it say that, uh, that our Head of State, the Queen, has signed into law in the United Kingdom under the wishes of a Conservative government uh, the very laws, the same-sex marriage laws that are such issue here? Uh, that tells us we're a constitutional monarchy. <laughs> well, well yeah, of course it tells us yes. we're a constitutional monarchy. Does it mm. tell us something about how conservative our views are as a country on this issue? I think you can see very clearly the conservative direction that Mr Abbott would take this government and would take our country. He's not prepared personally uh, to even allow a conscience vote uh, among the members of his party, and it's something he should do. Give us, uh, given your legal insight and your, your attention on this issue, give us a sense of where you think this will play out under this government. Where will we be on the same-sex marriage issue in two or three years' time? I think that it's uh, this government having taken the step of creating this diversion in the High Court, uh, that's going to hold things up for some time and that's regrettable. Uh, but over time, I think we will get I won't put a timeline on it, but over time we're going to get to the same position that New Zealand and the United Kingdom have already reached and already I think around a dozen states in the United States have reached uh, where we will have marriage equality. Bob Carr has just justified his departure from the Senate uh, straight after an election by saying, well, Australians don't vote for individuals in the Senate, they vote for parties. So it doesn't really matter that an individual chooses to leave so soon after an election. Do you agree? Uh, that's been the constitutional position now for quite a long time, ever since the uh, Bjorki-Peterson government decided to break with convention and nominate uh, Albert Field to take a spot, a Labor Party spot in the Senate. The 1970s. Uh, yes, and uh, we changed our arrangements uh, to make it clear that it's the party that nominates a replacement in the Senate. I think that demonstrates that there's a very clear understanding in Australian politics that particularly in the Senate, people are voting for a party because our arrangements now for decades have been that it's the party which nominates the replacement. What's it say about an independent in the Senate <laughs> who doesn't represent a party? I mean, there are circumstances where Australians are very exercised about individuals in the Senate, aren't they? Uh, I think you'll find that it's a long time since we've had uh, an independent in the Senate. Uh, we've got Senator Xenophon, who's in a sense uh, had a party uh, nomination for a time. He's become more important than his party. Um, and you might find that the DLP senator from Victoria, um, Senator Madigan, uh, he might in time become more important than his party as well, simply because he's been there a long time. But parties are incredibly important in the Senate. and. Um, I think you'll find that the relatively publicly unknown uh, senators in waiting who've just been elected, they weren't elected because they were known. I don't think S Senator-elect Muir 
uh, was elected because his name was Muir. I think he was elected because he has a party uh, called the Motoring Enthusiast Party. A couple of issues uh, to close. MPs' expenses, you've repaid some from a contentious uh, skiing trip. Do you think well, I need to correct you there. Well, please do. There's nothing contentious about the skiing trip. There was a mistake made, and I made it very clear, an administrative error uh, in which for a two-week sitting period, my office prepared a form which claimed for the full period between my trip from Melbourne and my return to Melbourne, so, uh, 10 nights, uh, they shouldn't have, and I shouldn't have signed it. And as soon as the error was drawn to my attention, I've repaid the amount. It's, a, it's an administrative mistake. Uh, and I'm conducting a complete audit of all of the claims I've made in the last six years uh, to make sure that there's no other errors. Uh, and in the course of that audit, uh, I've been reminded that the department sometimes makes errors uh, where they correct the record. It, w it was an extraordinary set of circumstances where I think you made a public comment uh, about MPs' expenses, I think to our organisation, Fairfax Media, and within hours, there were question marks over your own personal expenses. Now, I don't know the source of those question marks. Do you? And are you concerned about some sort of tit-for-tat on MPs' expenses going on here? I'm not concerned about tit-for-tat. I think there are questions of principle here, and I didn't feel in the least bit concerned when the, I would, the mistake was drawn to my attention and I was able to apologise and repay the amount that didn't detract, to my mind in any way, from the points I'd been making about questionable claims being made by other MPs. There's a quite different situation where someone has made a claim that, and I was particularly commenting on uh, MPs attending weddings, uh, which happened repeatedly. Um, I don't think that most Australians looking at the attendance at a close friend's wedding would say that that could possibly be official business. And that was the point that I was making. What about meeting the party whip as official business, representing your electorate? Don Randall has flown across the country and back with his wife business class, apparently according to the Prime Minister, to meet his party whip. Is that the sort of thing the taxpayer ought to pay for? Well, I'd want to hear that from the whip and from Mr Randall, not just some floated suggestion from Mr Abbott. And I think Australians can expect better. Um, it'd want to be unbelievably confidential and unbelievably difficult to warrant spending more than $5,000 flying across the country to do something you could have done in a phone call. And it's a party whip, so it's party business. It's not the business of the electorate that he represents in Western Australia, is and it? And that's for Mr Abbott to explain. He's offering this excuse. It's for Mr Randall to explain. It's for now that Mr Inch has been roped into this for him to explain how that comes within the definition of electorate business. Uh, we are still in the dark. This is just a floated suggestion by Mr Abbott and uh, it's really not for him to offer this sort of um, guess. It's for Mr Inch and for Mr Randall to actually say something publicly about this. To close, Mark Dreyfus, uh, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service says that the 50,000 hectare bushfire near Lithgow in the Blue Mountains was caused by an army explosive training exercise. Uh, where do you think issues of culpability might come up here and how, how uh, uh, should we hold defence accountable if that is indeed what happened? Uh, it shows the need for care uh, when we've got tinder dry conditions and difficult weather conditions as, as has just occurred in the Blue Mountains that's led to these fires uh, taking place. Um, Defence say they're investigating. The Rural Fire Service has been very clear uh, in what they've said that this is where the fire started as the, in the course of explosives exercises um, and once the investigations are complete we'll be able to make that assessment. You don't think there's a legal issue here or might be a legal issue here? Of course there might be a legal issue. There's uh, litigation that's come out of the Royal Commission into the Black Saturday fires uh, down in Victoria on uh, in February the 7th, 2009, uh, that litigation is against the uh, one of the power network um, providers uh, as to maintenance of their poles and wires, having led to, in part, those catastrophic Black Saturday fires uh, to the north of Melbourne. And always you've got a potential issue of liability when it's possible to locate the cause of a fire. Even with our own defence force? Uh, with anybody. Um, the 
power grid provider or uh, a Defence Department um, exercise are all capable of causing a fire and potentially capable of giving rise to liability. Mark Dreyfus, you've been generous with your time. Thank you for coming into Breaking Politics. Good to be politics. here. Thank you.